really uh, delighted to have the deputy leader of one of the only political parties whose leader didn't hold a copy of the Sun on the front page. I, I, something inside me cringed with embarrassment that day when I saw Nick, Nick Clegg, David Cameron, Ed Miliband and Farage holding the, the Sun as if they were the rent boys of the British political, of the British, of the British um, media system. It is an absolute shameful day in British politics. However, there was one leader who wasn't on that page, and we're proud to have the deputy leader of that party here today, Shahar Ali. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any, uh, thank you, and I commend you for being here. Are there any climate change deniers out there, please? <laughs> Climate change deniers, come down please in your droves. The trouble is, I'm going to be prevented from speaking on the mainstream media unless there's a climate change denier next to me. I would just like to reflect on how the corporate media does its work, in particular to climate change. Now as we know, you can call it the single most important issue if you want, I would choose to, because it affects everything. There's nothing more painful or inhospitable than a dying planet. And that includes the economy, stupid. The bottom line is not the bottom line. The bottom line is a fabrication concocted not so many miles from here. It's a fabrication which is making the richer, richer. That's what it's affecting. It's making the 99% poorer every day of the week. So why is climate change and the very attempt to report climate change such a threat to this establishment? How does the corporate media do its work? Firstly, the simple trick of ignore. Just ignore the scientific evidence. Just ignore reporting on the damage that we are doing unprecedentedly through carbon consumption. Ignore the news or report it, but not in context. Every time that there is a climate change crisis or emergency or some form of human interest disaster, that's the only time we'll hear about it. Or I give you, I grant you that when the leader of the Conservative Party in 2007 goes out for photo op with Huskies, that then becomes a media story. I wonder whether that piece of the Arctic is still there, by the way. So it's not just ignoring the climate change agenda, it's putting it in a false context of an emergency and only an emergency. But guess what? It's a continual emergency that requires structural change and requires lifestyle change. And there's something actually that I despair about, because I don't want to have to form an opposition to anybody, because this problem is bigger than any one of us, and it's bigger than our artifices, either the economic artifices or the structural edifices that we build up to protect ourselves. And it's the richest, the environment ministers of this world, they do feel insulated, and they will be able to contend with the worst effects in their lifetime of climate change, but it's those who are suffering a double injustice halfway around the world, the Bangladeshis of this world, those in low-lying coastal areas suffering the consequences of sea level rises due to our overconsumption. There is a double injustice. That's what we mean when we say climate, just, climate change is a justice issue. Not only are they least responsible for the negative consequences of overconsumption, but they are least able to contend with the, the remedial action they can't afford it, that is required to be able to survive those consequences. So we need to be reporting about those things. We need to be challenging the false balance, balance as bias. That's why I wanted to have a climate change denier out here, because I can't speak otherwise. I'm not allowed. Because instead of the, the, ba the bias of balance, we need evidence for balance. We need the balance of evidence. That should be the criterion for reporting on climate change, because it is unanimous opinion, unanimous consensus among science. That's the one profession where you get rigorous, vigorous challenging and contestation of ideas. And guess what? They've 
every IPCC report, fifth and counting, is telling us the same thing. And we can't rely upon our international leaders and our international forums. It's going to have to be a grassroots action from the ground. And I don't want the, I don't want the media to have to be reporting, if they do at all, on lowest figures for marches. But guess what? That is news. Why is it news? Because there should be more of us. And we're on the same side here. That's the point. Why weren't more people marching on those climate change agendas? Because there should be. Because it's a collective problem. It's a collective action. The Green Party is actually full square. With Is there anybody here from the, um, the media, the manifesto for media reform? Because we stand by that. And we would. We're the only party that would implement in terms of um, protecting us against the vulnerabilities of 20% ownership of, of media. That is not conducive to democratic input and information. So we would protect against that. I've also heard mention here about local media. If you've got a newspaper anymore, a local newspaper, which isn't full brimming with um, generic news stories or propagandizing for the American dream, there, there was a semblance of local journalism there and we need that vitality. And so, to end, I mean, does that, has anybody heard of Amanda Knox? Yes. Why do we keep hearing endlessly? That's my Room 101 candidate number one, by the way. Why do we keep hearing about Amanda Knox? How is that on the radar on prioritisation, the most important issue facing the planet? It's not. So we're faced with this distortion, and everybody knows the importance of information and knowledge, and I'm a firm believer that you, if you just prevent, people are as intelligent as you take yourself to be. You need to give that information. They're not alarmed by it unnecessarily. They're alarmed by it for good reason. They will flock to the polling booths. They will ask, how, why aren't there people who are going to implement the change beyond the next electoral cycle that's required? And if they're not standing, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. You are going to stand. We're going to turn this around. We need to turn this around because it's far bigger than us. We're one of the last remaining generations who can turn this around. And if that sounds alarming, it is. But it's not alarmist. It's alarming for all the right reasons. Because we, as a species, maybe there are better things to happen to this planet than the extinction of the human race Homo sapiens. I hope, you know, I, I dread to think that, but let's not take all the other beautiful species out with us. Let's actually have a care for the stewardship of the planet. Let's think about how we're actually conveying that information and making it active so that people aren't just being fed that information and then parking it somewhere um, in order, you know, while they're just having to deal with content with all the other structural inequalities in society. We need to deal with those wholesale. We need to construct a currency worthy of the name, which costs our consumption according to the planet. And if it were a carbon-based currency, <laughs> then it that would also incorporate equality at a stroke. Because what would happen is that you would have a quota that you were unable to, a budget that you could use over the year, and everybody would have the same allowance. Uh, the rich and the poor, would have the same allowance and they'd be forced to think about the consumption and what they're doing for future generations. So I simply end, we all understand the importance of unbiased information. I don't think there's anything such as unbiased as such, but we're intelligent enough if we have all the sources at our disposal and we seek it out in this internet age of ours, we can work out where the truth lies. And that's the importance of challenging and contestation. And we are funding a lot of these uh, mainstream media, if, it's, if they're not introducing balance, as you know, there may be 275,000 people who actually railed against the marginalisation of the Green Party. But whichever party that was, they understood what it meant not for people to have a, a, a voice when they had every right and entitlement to that. And all we're asking for here, we're demanding, it's not a protest, as Tony Blair used to say, it's a demand. Because we need, we require, and we're entitled to free dissemination of information and it's for not to be monopolised and not to be bastardised and propagandised. And that's all I have to say. And good luck for the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I only managed to get down to Balcom twice. I didn't manage to be an occupier there. But I was in huge awe of what I call the Balcom heroes. They were amazing, inspiring. Um, people saying, I have, this is my line. And they, were, they, were, they said fracking was the climate change line. We, we're trashing the planet. We cannot afford to burn more than 20% of what we already have. To spend more money and billions discovering more oil and more fossil fuels is nuts. It's criminal. And those people drew a line peacefully in the sand and went down there and occupied. And what did the press do? 
I, I, I looked at a report, I saw a report in the Telegraph talking about the violent protests in Balkan. <laughs> and I was horrified because I knew they had trained people like we have here. We actually went for training sessions on Gandhian non-violence. And I know that the occupied people in Balkan were training people in non-violence and really taking it seriously. And in the face of extraordinary provocation and violence by the security guards and the police, extraordinary provocation, with even the, the Green Party MP's son being, tr being really aggressively attacked in front of her, in front of the mother. It was cruel. They were peaceful, amazing, inspiring heroes. So when I read that this was a violent protest, I thought, that's my life. And I decided to use the so-called um, complaint system. I filed, what was, it, what was it called, the previous one before Ipso? The, I filed under the Press Complaints Commission, I filed a complaint. I said, these protests were not violent. Within four days, the Telegraph responded and said, the editor of the Telegraph said, excuse me, those protests were violent because the police were violent to the protesters. They said the protest was violent because the police were violent to the protesters. The, pro the complaint process allows you to, you're supposed to negotiate, and I said that's completely acceptable, unacceptable. I wish to, to take the complaint to the full formal hearing. I said, you have actually confirmed what we were saying, that the police were violent to the protesters, not the protesters were violent. So therefore, quid, quid pro quo, the sorry, QED, it was not a violent protest. The policing was violent. When it went to the full uh, complaint process, the Telegraph said, I was manipulating the English language on behalf of, of my biased political prejudice. They said, I was manipulating the English on behalf of my political pre uh, prejudice. This is the five billionaires. This is the corruption that we've got. It went to the final tribunal. Guess what happened? Lost. The tribunal upheld the telegraph line. Of so what the Press Complaints Commission said is that the police, all the police have to do is to attack us and in their eyes we are violent. That is why we are here today. That is why Occupy is angry, but it's non-violent. That's why we're going to be here all week. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Sharar.